Hi everyone, so the purpose of this last lecture is to provide you with a review of key course themes, concepts, and definitions in preparation for the final exam. And just as a disclaimer, not everything that I discuss here will be guaranteed to be on the exam, and not everything on the exam is guaranteed to be discussed here. We'll be looking at about eight different themes from the weeks that we have covered in this class. Week two focused on historical perspectives, three and four on older and more contemporary theories, week five was on psychopathy, seven on the magnitude of youth crime, youth justice in week eight, youth policing in week nine, courts and corrections in week 10, and gangs in week 11. So I'll be covering some key material from each of these weeks. And we'll start with the very first sort of week of course material, not including the first week, which focused on the history of youth. So not just youth offending, but how youth were viewed by society. And we'll trace the course of different perspectives on youth at different eras, beginning in the Middle Ages in medieval Europe, when it was the perspective that there was really no such thing as a youth. Children and youth were viewed just as miniature adults. There was no separation of stages of the life course. The perspective of the time was that children were born evil and this was linked to original sin. The Catholic Church dominated the judicial system through this hegemonic approach, which means they controlled basically the public's access to information. And this was why the predominant explanation of crime at the time was demonic possession. There were no real theories of crime. If children are born evil and if people are involved in crime, it must be related to the devil, the devil's doing. Following from the medieval period, there were some key stages in between, but another key stage that emerged in the 18th century was the Enlightenment, because we began to see a decline in the sort of stranglehold on the judicial system by the church. Greek and Roman thought begins to spread, new ideas emerge, that sort of are separate or distinct from religious themes. And these ideas get spread through trade. So the idea of trade wasn't to spread new ideas. The idea of trade was to get new things, to make money, to establish different industries. It wasn't just about farming of land. But the result of this trade in physical goods also resulted in the trade of non-tangible goods, specifically ideas. And we began to see new conceptions of childhood. They were more humane, believing that kids had certain rights or needs. And so there was this increasing focus on science over religion. In Canada, when we get to the Industrial Revolution, we begin to see some serious consequences for children. Families are deserted or children are brought over from Europe on their own to work and they're taken advantage of by employers or they get to Canada and they find that there is no work. And this created an industry of prostitution. There were very poor social conditions and there was no real social safety net, which resulted in a decrease in legal rights for young persons or at least the legal rights for young persons were much poorer when held against adults. Many reformers of the time, reformers wanting to see changes in the law, saw causes of youth crime and immorality as lying in social welfare problems that resulted from a loss of agrarian roots. So here's where we see like that our generation was never this bad perspective, the belief that there's something wrong with the kids of today. And the loss of agrarian roots was speaking to the idea that kids were no longer being monitored as much. They were no longer engaging in things like apprenticeships. They were either working in factories where they were left on their own to sort of work these particular machines, or they didn't have a job, and so they were out begging in the streets. Looking back, before even the ideas of Canada were alive, there was early perspectives on youth justice, not to say that there were distinct youth justice systems. In fact, pre-enlightenment, there was no idea of youth or children as a distinct age stage. Children were just treated as miniature adults, as I mentioned, so there was no need to even think of a separate justice system. But over time, we began to see, especially through trade from Italy, or what was then Rome, where 
the notion of patria postestas, the idea that the father had absolute control and children were their possession. So now this idea of child becomes a thing. It's not necessarily a good thing because we're looking at children as possessions as opposed to human beings. But now they're thinking about youth differently, that at least it's something for the parents to consider, or more specifically, the father to consider. And over time, we saw sort of a improved understanding of the idea, well, what happens if a child is an orphan, or what if the parents cannot take care of the child? Well, the king is supposed to be the father of the country, this idea of parents patriae. So the court would then take responsibility for the child if the parents and other family members are deemed unfit, but still there's no distinct youth justice system. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the perspective of youth crime during agrarian society was that the fur trade was largely responsible for why youth were engaging in crime, and the fur trade had two sort of themes that were influencing crime. One was that it exposed youth to adulthood, and one was that it gave youth too much freedom. Under the Industrial Revolution, there was a different perspective on why youth engaged in crime, or at least what was happening was that as you can see in this slide here, we had the Loop 1, or what was known as the Central Business District. And then we see this zone in transition. And so that loop is where like all the businesses are. And the zone in transition is where we would see kids who were living in poverty. And people who were coming from residential zones would travel through the zone in transition to get to the business district. And through these travels, they would get exposed to kids on the street. They would see ethnocentric gangs. They would have this perception of increases in violent crime. And it's all out there. People are being exposed to this crime. Back in the agrarian roots, when people lived so far from one another, it was difficult to actually witness crime yourselves. With industrialization and the increase of like urbanization, we begin to see crime more out in the open. And at this time, but also moving forward, there were different perspectives on how we should respond to youth crime. And we see these perspectives persist today. Youth advocates were interested in the problems experienced by young people, particularly wanting to address poverty and unemployment, and believing that media is exaggerating or misrepresenting youth crime. Kind of like the welfare model that we'll talk about later on when discussing types of formal youth justice systems. Then we have the law and order advocates that maybe more so resemble the crime control model of youth justice. The belief that youth are out of control and are involved in violence, they lack respect for others and responsibility. So we need policies that get tough on youth. It's not the lack of means, it's not the lack of housing or employment, it's that kids just don't care. And so if we punish them, if we show that we're serious about crime, that will change their perspective. Not all child advocates were necessarily positive. Under the child saving movement in the late 19th century, we saw some really good people like John Joseph Kelso, who helped establish a lot of humane societies and shelters and things like that. But generally speaking, the child saving movement was almost more of a religious movement. And at the time, it was more of a conflict between Protestant values and Catholic values. And Protestants formed this child saving movement and kind of looked at Catholic values as out of balance with what they believed was right. And so they focused on trying to take care of children, but it wasn't really like we want to just take care of them. We want them to look more like our own children. So just to reiterate on in terms of like how these different eras viewed crime, in medieval Europe around the 6th to 7th century, Original sin was viewed as the cause of crime, and the Catholic Church kind of was the justice system. Then we see from the 14th to 16th century a movement away from serfdom. So there's no longer a group of people living on a particular plot of land owned by a king or something like that. There's now individuals are farming their own land, and it's a subsistence-based culture where people are farming what they need to eat for themselves. And the church is still really important, but the church isn't the justice system. These are separate factors or separate systems. When we get to the 17th and 18th century, we begin to see capitalism as a concept emerge. And this concept emerged from another thing that was called mercantilism. Mercantilism was where, especially when we saw 
England, for example, but it was also like the Dutch, the Spanish would colonize different areas and they would put one particular company responsible for mining in that particular new colony. And there would be a dedicated company, it wasn't necessarily the state, that would be responsible for bringing all of the gold back to England, for example, or back to Spain. And so during this time, because there was this trade and exchanging of ideas, we saw new perspectives on the causes of youth crime. When we got to the 19th and 20th century, we begin to see the Industrial Revolution where there's a separation of youth and adults in terms of youth being a distinct developmental stage. But unfortunately, during this time, we saw severe poor, severely poor working conditions, and that led to the Child Savers Movement. So to reiterate, during these different periods, there were different perspectives on youth itself as a developmental stage and different perspectives on what was causing youth crime. The Industrial Revolution really brought juvenile delinquency much more out and into the open, and that sort of established, especially in part because of the Child Savers Movement, established the need for a juvenile justice system. And in week three, we began to focus on early theories of crime, and it was important to first establish what theory actually means. So theory is describing an interrelated set of hypotheses meant to describe some phenomenon of interest. In criminology, that phenomenon is usually crime. And the key features of theory include parsimony, which is referring to simplicity. A theory needs to identify causal mechanisms, mediators, and moderators. So what actually causes crime or what might lead crime to happen in some conditions but not others? When describing these hypotheses, they need to be testable and thus falsifiable. We need to actually be able to go out and conduct research to see whether or not this theory is accurate. When we're testing these theories, we're looking to see if they have empirical support. And if they don't, we should get rid of these theories. We should stop paying attention to these theories. Early theories, especially, were not very interdisciplinary and were not very respectful. Interdisciplinary theories are those that are going to be considering like psychological factors and sociological factors, something that we might call today intersectionality. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's the same thing when looking at key features of a theory. The type of principle, whether parsimony is prioritized or whether the key is to be interdisciplinary or respectful, it kind of varies across different persons. We'll start in the classical school. But certainly theories of crime existed before the classical school, but they were pretty simplistic. They were like, kind of like, oh, demonic possession, for example. The classical school of criminology believed that persons are rational, intelligent beings who can exercise free will, and therefore criminal behavior is a choice. Because criminal behavior is a choice, it means that people are determining that the benefits of crime outweigh the costs of crime. And so people like Cesare Beccaria and Jeremy Bentham said that we need to make sure that we have a codified set of laws that dictate the types of punishment individuals will experience if they violate those laws. That will make sure that the benefits of committing crime no longer outweigh the costs of committing crime. Bentham was also not just saying like, well, we'll make crime so, so serious that nobody will commit an offense. Proportionality of punishment was necessary so that people would believe in the system in the first place. But basically the classical school said that all people are equal, all people have free will. And that was something that the positivist school kind of disagreed with. They kind of said that no, lots of people are different and there will be different reasons for why people engage in crime. So the key principle of positivist criminology is that only that which is observable through the scientific method is knowable. So keep in mind that this is a principle. When we look at the work of Lombroso or Goddard, we can see that their scientific method was very, very rudimentary. They were much more ideological than scientific. So they're kind of using science as like a like masquerading in science when really they were using sort of science to like hide their ideological perspective. And so Lombroso, for example, focused on the born criminal, the idea that features, physical features of convicted criminals was evidence of a biological explanation of crime. The problem with Lombroso is that he never used comparison groups, for example. So he never really got to look at the physical features of non-convicted criminals to see if the physical features 
differed between those who were actually convicted of crimes. We talked about Henry Goddard when we looked at the Kalakak family, and he kind of argued, oh, if we look at Kalakak and we look at his offspring from the barmaid and the offspring from his wife, the offspring of his wife are much more well-to-do than those of the barmaid, and therefore there's a genetic effect of crime, and that's why we should conduct this eugenics movement. And we know this was complete garbage science because there were a wealth of socioeconomic factors, for example, that could be impacting the children of the barmaid, but those were never taken into consideration. If you were doing positivist methodology correctly, you would be doing or considering those factors. So it's more just like, this. these are some ideas, but they weren't really carried out in practice. Other things that Lombroso focused on specifically were phrenology or the shape of a person's head. And he studied persons in custody to identify the atavistic man, which is an important term. It's referring to an offender as an evolutionary throwback or someone who is not fully evolved. Sheldon tried to look specifically at something very easily measurable, which is somebody's body type, but he presumed that body type wasn't just a measure of physical attributes, it was also a measure of personality attributes. So for example, for the ectomorph, it wasn't just that they were skinny, it was that being skinny would be associated with personality characteristics like being withdrawn or timid, and that's why they would not be involved in crime. Similarly, the endomorph, by being obtuse, they were more likely to be outgoing and jolly, like a Santa Claus, and that's why they would not be involved in crime. And the mesomorph was muscular, and that's why they would be aggressive, and that's why they would be involved in crime. Family studies are useful in some ways. For example, we can look at how criminality is more common in some families than others. We can also see how criminality by the mother can have a stronger influence on future criminality of their offspring than criminality by the father. But this might speak more to, for example, the fact that mothers are more likely to raise their children and so more likely to have an influence on their children. But these findings cannot then be used to make a claim about a genetic effect. So we cannot say that criminality within the family is due to genetic makeup because that family might be experiencing the same environmental factors as well. And those environmental factors shared by that family might be the reason why they commit crime. So a way around this to deal with the environmental component is to conduct twin studies of monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. Monozygotic twins are those who are 100% identical in their DNA, whereas dizygotic twins are no more genetically similar than two siblings of different ages. But dizygotic twins are different from siblings of different ages because dizygotic twins are likely to be raised in the exact or at least a very similar environment. So when we look at dizygotic twins and monozygotic twins, each twin pair is being raised in the same environment. So if we see a stronger concordance in criminal behavior amongst monozygotic twins compared to dizygotic twins, those who advocate for twin studies say that that's an indication of a genetic effect. I wouldn't really call what Freud did a criminological theory. Freud never really even talked about crime, but he did develop ideas that were influential in criminological theories down the road. So Freud distinguished between three key elements of personality or consciousness. The first is the id, it describes how we seek immediate pleasure, these hedonistic drives or instincts. The ego is our reality-oriented thinking, like being rational about the situations that we're in. And our superego is our conscience, and it's required to sort of internalize society's standards, and then it's been used to regulate the id. And so what happens is if we have an underdeveloped superego, it won't be able to appropriately regulate the id, and then people will just do whatever they want to do as opposed to whatever they ought to do. And this is what could lead to criminal behavior. Look, again, for it didn't really say specifically crime. Problems with the development of superego are related to poor parenting and trauma. We also talk this is a little bit more of a contemporary perspective, but classical conditioning, you'll be all familiar with Pavlov's experiment. We have a bell, which is a neutral stimulus, and then we have an unconditional stimulus, like a perfectly cooked piece of steak, and that unconditional stimulus of steak is typically producing an unconditioned response. That unconditioned response is salivation. 
But if we pair the neutral stimulus of the bell with the stake, we can create what's called a conditional response, where we remove the unconditional stimulus, aka the stake, but when we ring the bell, we can get somebody to continue to salivate or will salivate. So this is then what we would call a conditioned response. The salivation is in response to the bell we've created or we've conditioned an individual to salivate in response to this bell. However, we'll also see what's called a process of extinction. If we just keep ringing the bell and we never ever return the stake, then that conditioned response will disappear. And these ideas have been used in Canadian and American correctional systems for uh, maybe more so in the 1960s and 70s, maybe a little bit into the 80s with this idea of aversive conditioning. The idea of aversive conditioning is if we expose someone to something that they enjoy and then pair that with an unpleasant stimulus, then that person will no longer enjoy that thing. And so this was used in the context of intervention strategies for persons involved in sex offenses. They would read what's called an, like an epithet. It could be a description, for example, of a child at a park. And if an individual is, has a sexual attraction to children, this might be something that they enjoy. But then what will happen is this epithet will be paired with an electric shock. So every time the person is exposed to this description of a child, they experience an unpleasant stimulus. And the belief was that this would help remove the person's sexual interest in children. But a concern appears to be that by pairing pain with something that this individual enjoys, basically an individual begins to associate pain with sexual pleasure, which could actually make things worse. So those are some early psychological perspectives. Then we also have some early sociological perspectives. One was developed by Merton, and he talked a lot about modes of adaptation. This is describing people who will accept the means associated with conventional society and accept the goals or experience the goals of conventional society. So means equal work hard and honestly, goal equals buy a house with a white picket fence, etc., etc. Conformists are people who accept the means and achieve the goals. People who are innovators, they reject the means, but they still accept the goals. So this could be somebody involved in, for example, drug trafficking, where they want to use the money earned from drug trafficking and spend that money on conventional goals like getting a house. We could see individuals who are associated with rebellion. And this is where instead of rejecting the means and rejecting the goals, they'll actually kind of be like anarchists and they want to replace the means and replace the goals. So they want to see sort of like a fundamental shift in conventional society. One of the other groups would be the retreatists who effectively experience a rejection of the means and a rejection of the goals. And then ritualists are those who accept the means but are unable to attain the goals. And this is something that could create strain and that could also lead to crime. So the failure to attain goals could lead to using criminal behavior as a way to cope or express your needs. Sean McKay, we kind of saw them earlier, they developed concentric zone theory, so that idea of the zone in transition, where individuals in this particular area will have more of a difficulty with things like unemployment, people moving in and out of that neighborhood, and that will result in higher crime rates. And this is more of a perspective on why rates of crime are higher as opposed to why particular people engage in crime. And they use social disorganization theory to sort of help explain why crime is higher in the zone in transition. So social disorganization theory says that there are three reasons why crime rates will be higher. The first is a lack of collective efficacy. Collective efficacy is useful for like communities to organize, rally together, to set up neighborhood block watches, things like that. Another factor is what they refer to as like ethnic or cultural heterogeneity. They believe that greater levels of diversity would result in different cultural values, people not necessarily watching out for one another, and that could lead to higher levels of crime. 
And finally, the third factor is residential mobility. So higher levels of neighborhood turnover, like more people moving in and out of those neighborhoods would result in more crime because you wouldn't necessarily have, know your neighbors and have people watching out for you. Differential association theory in Edwin Southern is maybe one of the more like famous sociological theories and they simply argued that individuals will engage in crime if they are exposed to other people, especially those people who they care about, who experience positive rewards from their criminal behavior. So they learn their criminal behavior by watching others. Sykes and Matza talked about techniques of neutralization. For example, they would talk about, for gang members, an appeal to higher loyalties. Like, I'm not really responsible for my behavior because I was doing it on behalf of the gang. Or they might deny their responsibility or deny that there was a victim. Or they would condemn the condemner. So they'd say, like, who is a judge to say whether what I'm doing is wrong or not? Okay, so we'll transfer or transition now over to some more contemporary theories of crime, beginning with opportunity-based perspectives, which didn't really look so much at the characteristics of the perpetrator of an offense. They just looked at the qualities necessary for a crime to occur. And so what Conan Felsen talked about in routine activity theory was that crime would occur if there was a motivated offender, suitable target, and an absence of a capable guardian. And the idea here is that if you remove just one of those three factors, then a crime would not occur. In 1969, Travis Hershey developed his social bond theory to try and explain why people did not commit crime. So he developed or described four social bonds. The first one is attachment. It describes that an individual will have a closeness with others and they won't want to engage in crime because if they do, it could jeopardize their relationship with these other people. Hershey also talked about commitment to conventional activities. So for example, if somebody was playing on their high school hockey team and they were involved in an act of, for example, school bullying, or they got into a fight at the schoolyard, that might threaten their ability to play hockey. So they won't want to get into a fight because they will lose their investment. They will lose out on something, not just that they enjoyed, but something that they've been working at, and it will seem sort of worthless to just lose that conventional activity. Involvement is all about time. It's the idea that if an individual is involved in enough pro-social activities, they'll have no time to actually go out and engage in antisocial ones. And lastly, belief is the description that an individual will respect and believe in conventional social norms, which usually are in relation to things like religion, not harming others, respecting your neighbors, your elders, and so on. So that was 1969, but then in 1990, Travis Hershey changed his perspective, and he, along with Michael Garverson, developed this idea about low self-control. They argued that one single construct explains all crime all the time. So remember, we talked about principles of theories. There could not be a more parsimonious theory than this. Low self-control, according to Garfs and Hershey, explains homicide, but it also explains white-collar crime. It could explain drug trafficking. It could explain a B&E, &E, an arson, does not matter. Persons with low self-control were characterized by impulsivity, being insensitive to the feelings or needs of others, being risk-taking, short-sighted, preference for using nonverbal reactions like physical fighting as opposed to verbal expressions of their needs, and they would desire instant gratification. So there were three things that parents had to do, and if they failed to do any one of these three things, then between ages 8 to 10, low self-control would develop. So first, parents need to actually be at supervising their children. They need to be around. They need to be around so that they can notice poor behavior. So they need to actually understand what is and what is not socially appropriate behavior. They can't just be in the room. They need to see when the behavior is wrong. And when they do recognize wrong behavior, they need to respond to that behavior with an appropriate parenting strategy. So like an authoritative rather than an authoritarian parenting strategy. According to Garfs and Hershey, low self-control remains stable over the life course, and people do not change. So students often get confused by this theory, not because they don't understand the theory, they just don't understand like how could 
this theory be so simplistic and it's obviously wrong. And so you're right. When we look at empirical research, we can see, for example, that no, low self-control does not explain all crime. There are a bunch of other factors that matter as well and even matter more. Low self-control also is very unstable. We see a lot of change over the life course, especially in early childhood and then again between late adolescence and early adulthood. But what Garfield and Hershey did that's really valuable is they challenged other theorists to take into account their assertions that low self-control caused all crime all the time. So they had to look at like, okay, does my theory actually improve upon the explanation of crime once I account for low self-control? Do people actually change over time? So the theory might have been wrong, but it produced a lot of research that was really good and really useful. Another more contemporary theory is Akers' social learning theory, where he combines Sutherland's idea of differential association and C. Ray Jeffrey's idea of differential reinforcement. So this is just very simple. People will learn by doing. That's their reinforcement part. So people could be positively or negatively reinforced. Positive reinforcement is giving something to someone that they like. Negative reinforcement is taking away something that they would not like. So if people get reinforced in either way, they're more likely to repeat their behavior. Same thing, but if they see other people reinforced for that behavior. And reinforcements can come in different ways, by family, by peers, and media. People will be more likely to replicate behavior if it's by someone they respect. And they'll be more likely to replicate behavior if the reinforcement is more often or like the, there's a higher probability of reinforcement or the reinforcement is really valuable like so they get something really valuable out of it. Developmental criminology is what I spend a lot of my time doing research on. One of the most famous developmental criminologists would be Terry Moffat and she made that distinction between adolescence limited and life course persistent offending so students should be able to describe the differences between those two. Developmental criminology is kind of different from the general theory of crime that says people don't change. Developmental criminology is all about studying within, within individual change. Not to say that developmental criminology doesn't say that people are never stable in their personality traits, for example, only that we need to actually monitor and measure this. We can measure different risk factors and examine criminal behavior as a dynamic process of how people change in their patterns of offending over time. Life course criminology is associated primarily with the work of Robert Sampson and John Lobb. And there are four major pillars of life course criminology, one of them being historical context. So we can't just study crime in a vacuum. We have to consider, for example, like was there a war during this era? Were there higher or abnormally high rates of unemployment during this era? And that could all factor into why people were committing crimes in that particular era versus another. Another important thing to consider is the notion of linked lives and social capital. So who you know matters in helping you to get a job or helping you get a house, having uh, your, you know, your needs taken care of. One thing that life course and developmental criminology agree upon is the idea that risk factors are age graded. So why somebody engages in antisocial behavior at age eight would be different from why someone does so at age 18 or 28 or 58. So we have to take into consideration a person's developmental stage when trying to explain crime. Another thing that life course criminology emphasizes that maybe developmental criminology doesn't emphasize as much is this idea of human agency. This idea that people don't necessarily need intervention or treatment. They can, through their own sheer will, change their sort of path in life. I don't really like talking about sort of initial theoretical perspectives on why girls and women are involved in crime because they were just particularly ideological and sexist. But over time, we've seen some more sociological and psychological perspectives of crime, some that have also been based on women's status at the particular era under examination. So the chivalry hypothesis suggests that women commit less crime because men are less likely to punish them. They're less likely to see their behavior as problematic. 
or because of their roles by being more inside the house as homemaker that would provide them with fewer opportunities to engage in crime. And again, this is a perspective that sort of dates back to around the 1950s, 1960s. We can look at sociological sources of crime where there's a big emphasis on marginalization and oppression. For example, patriarchal structures that limit the woman's sort of financial freedom or economic marginalization, and that can lead to the need to go out and perpetrate offenses, or maybe men and women are not treated equally in the workplace or not being, women do not receive equal pay, and therefore they are required to go out and engage in crime in order to sort of meet their needs because the job or the economic system or employment system can't provide for them. Psychological perspectives will focus primarily on how particular risk factors might matter more for girls and women compared to boys and men. So the personal, interpersonal, and community reinforcement theory, for example, has especially emphasized experiences of abuse. For week five, we talked about features of psychopathy among youth. No surprise because this is my probably my favorite topic. There will definitely be some key questions on the exam about psychopathy. Psychopathy is a personality disorder, so it's important for students to remember that personality disorders cannot be diagnosed in adolescence. So that's why we talk about features of psychopathy rather than the term psychopath or talking about youth psychopathy. We can also be sort of cognizant of the fact that because youth are especially susceptible to labeling, even, even using the term features of psychopathy can be protected potentially damaging. When we're talking about psychopathy, we're talking about deficits in or functional impairments in interpersonal, affective, and behavioral domains. So affective functioning refers to kind of how we internalize or view, like feel ourselves. So talking about, for example, emotions like callous and unemotional traits. Interpersonal traits are more about how we interact with others, whether we're manipulative, domineering, but also kind of how we see ourselves as so narcissistic traits like grandiosity and self-aggrandizing. Behavioral domains are about sort of just exactly how it sounds, behavior like sensation seeking, impulsivity, it's a lot like low self-control. We care about psychopathy because it's really an important predictor of future offending. Those who are associated with strong features of psychopathy are not just associated with offending more broadly, but we can look at different types of offending outcomes. And we found that features of psychopathy are associated with general recidivism, violent recidivism, a higher frequency of offending, more serious forms of offending, and offending in particular contexts. For example, individuals in custody are more likely to commit crimes in custody if they have strong features of psychopathy. And so this presents a challenge for institutions. In the community, maybe only about half to one percent of the general population presents with strong features of psychopathy. When it comes to prison populations, we'd find more like 15 to 25 percent would have strong features of psychopathy. Some will also point to the fact that when individuals have strong features of psychopathy, it has implications for treatment and rehabilitation. For example, individuals with psychopathy might be less amenable or open to treatment. Another thing that we have to consider is that if treatment is being conducted in a group setting, individuals with strong features of psychopathy may be manipulative and may be more likely to use what somebody says during treatment against them. So they could be very destructive during treatment. It's important to understand how we measure psychopathy. I've talked about the psychopathy checklist youth version as one way that we measure features of psychopathy in youth. Another measurement instrument that I'm familiar with and have used in the past is the Comprehensive Assessment of Psychopathic Personality, also called the CAP, and it's comprised of 33 symptoms that are divided into six conceptual domains. Those domains are attachment, behavioral, cognitive, dominance, emotional, and self. For the purposes of the final exam, you do not need to memorize all 33 symptoms but you should be able to describe the CAP in terms of naming each of the six domains, and then you should be able to pick one of those domains, and you should be able to name and describe 
each symptom within that domain. Whichever domain you choose to focus on is up to you, but you should have a good understanding of what the symptoms look like within that domain. So it's not enough just to list them, you have to describe and define them. One of the values of the cap is that it is scored with zero reference to criminal behavior, so this helps us avoid some tautological issues. A tautological issue in general is where our independent variable, what we are using to predict our dependent variable, is actually defined by, at least in part, defined by our dependent variable. So if we're trying to use psychopathy to predict crime, we shouldn't be using crime to measure psychopathy. But that's exactly what some instruments like the PCL do. So the CAP tried to address that by focusing more so on interpersonal and affective features of psychopathy. So that's how we measure psychopathy. But before we get to measurement, like, or if we're going to have a good measure, it's only going to be useful if we can do the interview in the right way. So in week five, I also talked about interview skills. So talking about how to build rapport when interviewing individuals, how to figure out how to respond to dishonesty, like being the bad cop. And if you catch somebody lying, sort of like getting angry or questioning them about why they're lying might not be very effective and could lead to, for example, poor rapport. So one of the solutions I talked about was that Columbo approach where you kind of feign confusion and you present the youth, for example, with two things that they said that kind of contradicted one another and you ask them to clarify, like, what's going on here? Help me understand what's going on. It's also really important to think about the developmental stage of the person who you're interviewing. And this is important for a couple of reasons. One, you might need to adapt questions just to make them simpler to understand. But you also might need to adapt questions so that they're actually appropriate for that developmental stage. So you don't want to necessarily be talking about work for a 14 year old, for example. When conducting interviews, you also want to be making sure that you're listening to what the person is saying. One of the things that I see that's a mistake like all the time is where individuals will ask like three questions at once, or they just can't wait to ask their second question. Like they, they ask question number one and then blah, 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 somebody else is talking, I can't wait to ask my second question. Your first question is going to lead to an answer and that answer is going to dictate the next question that you ask so that you can have more of a natural conversation. So that you ask the right follow-up questions, you have to have that active listening strategy. And then that's going to be helpful for managing the integrity of the interview, making sure that the person wants to participate, that they're not getting tired, and that that sort of, sort of drain and having to answer these interpersonal questions is not going to actually make them want to just give short or incomplete answers. The next lecture that we had focused on for this semester was describing the nature and extent of youth crime. So looking, for example, at crime rates and how they've changed over time in Canada. But to understand changes in crime, we have to understand where our information on crime comes from. And generally speaking, there are three main sources of crime, the media, official statistics, and information provided by researchers. When it comes to the media, these are things that are sort of like the most easily accessible or most widely available. When it comes to official data, we're talking about data that we might get from police or from courts or from correctional facilities, and these are considered data that are the most reliable. And here's why. When it comes to the recording of crime, let's say if we're looking, for example, at data from courts, well, the court has to record when somebody was convicted. It has to say the offense that they were convicted of. It has to say the sentence that they received. So we know that this information is going to be really, really accurate. But what we miss from these official data are offenses that go undetected by the justice system. So, for example, we could see that if we're using arrest statistics, well, not all people who commit crime are arrested. Among people who are arrested, not all people go to court. Among people who go to court, some people are found not guilty, and so they're not going to show up in correctional data. So we get reliable data, but it might not necessarily be valid in terms of describing, for example, the general frequency of offending amongst the population. So self-report and victimization surveys are typically thought to be more valid in terms of representing the prevalence of crime or the frequency of crime amongst individuals.
So self-report studies are going to be focusing on individuals self-reporting their involvement in crime. Victimization surveys talk about when an individual has been a victim of a crime. And that can sometimes be limited because certain crimes, like drug trafficking, it's difficult to actually identify a specific victim. The problem with self-report studies and victimization surveys is an issue with telescoping. Telescoping is where we report an event that truly did happen, but it happened in the wrong time period for like, or we misremember it and we report it happening in the wrong time period. So let's say that I wanted to know the prevalence of offending amongst individuals in grade 11. So I ask individuals at the start of grade 12, how often were you involved in crime in the last year when you were in grade 11? So these grade 12 students remember back to grade 11 and they report a particular offense. And one grade 11 student reports, a, or excuse me, grade 12 student reports a crime that they think happened in grade 11, but it actually happened in grade 10. So yes, the crime did occur, but they it actually occurred two grades ago. And so they've, we were going to therefore overestimate the prevalence of crime if this person is saying that the crime did happen in grade 11 or we could underestimate the crime if the person thinks that the crime happened in grade 10 when it actually did happen in grade 11. So generally speaking when we're doing these surveys we want to make sure that we're not asking individuals to try and recall from a really long period ago. Like we don't want to do a survey of individuals who are 50 years old and ask them about the age of onset of their first you know, time that they used drugs, for example, or the first time that they committed an assault. When we look at the youth crime rate in Canada, since the 1990s, we've seen a fairly steady decrease. And this is true regardless of the type of crime that we're looking at. And what's especially important is looking post YCJA. What we've seen here is an increase in the number of youth who are being diverted and a decrease in the number of youth being charged. And the degree of increase in diversion basically mirrors the decrease in the number of youth being charged. And this is really important because we would be really worried if like there was a lot, a lot, a lot of youth being diverted, but only a small decline in the number of youth being charged. Because what this could indicate is net widening. So for example, by diverting youth, we might be diverting them into particular like extrajudicial measures or extrajudicial sanctions. But what if in the past, police officers didn't do extrajudicial measures or extrajudicial sanctions and not because they instead arrested and charged the youth, but because they would normally let those kids go in the first place. So if a kid committed a really non-serious offense, then maybe the police officer would just release them and not even bother with any type of diversion. So if we saw diversion really on the rise, but the charge rate not really dropping, then we would be worried. But what we're basically seeing here is probably that the decline in youth being charged might be represented by the individuals who are now being diverted. So this is effectively a good thing. Another good thing is that we've seen more kids being diverted, but not an increase in charges either. And what this suggests is that it's not as if kids now believe, oh, because the justice system is no longer as tough on crime, I can now get away with involvement in crime or I'll just get a slap on the wrist so it'll be, it'll be worthwhile. One of maybe the misperceptions that people have about crime is that it's, is the perception or their, their belief that most crime is committed by youth. In reality, in Canada, only about 20% of all crime is committed by kids between ages 12 to 17. What we see is that about 5 to 6% of all individuals might be responsible for about half of all crime. And generally speaking, when youth are involved in violent crime, for example, it's of a relatively minor nature. They're much more likely to be committing assaults than things like homicide offenses. In week 13, which will not be on the exam, I talked about some of the reasons for why Indigenous youth are overrepresented in the justice system and talked about how in this particular 
point in time, Indigenous youth represent about 25 to 30 percent of our court population. So this is a really important number to memorize for the exam. But I also don't want students just memorizing the number. It's not enough just to know that Indigenous youth are overrepresented. It's important to understand why this overrepresentation occurs and to have this understanding, we need to look back at the history of colonialism, the impact of attempted genocide on indigenous persons through, for example, effectively like biological warfare with smallpox blankets and things like that, and how this has led to the intergenerational transmission of trauma and how crimes can occur in the context of this trauma. Another reason for overrepresentation can relate to overpolicing where if we have a particular neighborhood with a higher crime rate than another neighborhood, police may choose to allocate a greater number of policing officers over to that neighborhood. And then that's going to increase the likelihood that people involved in crime in that neighborhood are detected for crime. And that can further contribute to overrepresentation in the justice system. When we look at the patterns of delinquency and offending amongst boys and girls, we can see some pretty key differences. Boys begin earlier, they're longer in their pattern of offending, they're more likely to continue to offend in adulthood, and they're more likely to commit more serious offenses. Boys are more likely to commit homicide offenses. But if we look among boys, so among boys who commit homicide offenses, boys are more likely to kill a non-family member. When we look at girls involved in homicide offenses, girls are more likely to kill a family member. It's also important to not forget that youth who are involved in crime are very often also the victims of crime. And when youth do perpetrate offenses, it's not as if they are targeting strangers. It's usually someone that they know and someone that they know that's of the same age as them. So another youth, it's not as if youth are targeting elderly victims or anything like that. So we know that kids involved in crime have higher rates of victimization than kids not involved in crime. When it comes to differences between boys and girls, boys are more likely to experience violent victimization excluding sexual offenses, whereas girls are more likely to experience sexual offenses and sexual victimization. So if we're talking about violence that's non-sexual, boys have higher victimization rates than girls, but things are about the same if we include sexual victimization in the definition of violent victimization. In, I guess it was around week seven, we talked about different youth justice acts in Canada. And so when we're going through these acts, students should be able to know the general era of the act, how that act viewed criminal behavior and what its purpose was, and some of the limitations or criticisms that led to its downfall. So from 1908 to 1984, Canada had the Juvenile Delinquents Act, where youth were viewed as delinquent rather than criminal. They received dispositions rather than sentenced. And they were responded to with these dispositions for the purposes of protection, treatment, and rehabilitation. But unfortunately, protection and treatment were kind of influenced by the child savers, and this was often in the form of indeterminate sentences where they were effectively trying to have the youth change their culture and their, for example, religious beliefs. So, Catholic youth were targeted and indigenous youth were targeted. And back then there was not so much of a concern for due process, which meant that youth often received disproportionate punishment and often in the form of indeterminate sanctions, where effectively a kid at age 14 could be put in a reform school up until age basically whenever the probation officer deemed that it was necessary to have them rehabilitated. So they could be, they could have committed, you know, theft from a store, but they could be in that reform school for a year if the probation officer felt that that individual wasn't making an effort to learn a new language or practice religion or go to school, things like that. A lot of criticisms with the JDA, one being too much judicial discretion, that's in relation to like some youth would be transferred to adult court, others would not, even though they committed the same offense, and we could see how minority youth would be more likely to be transferred to adult court. We also had a very broad definition of delinquency at that time, which included status offenses, which are an offense for which a youth could be punished, but not an adult. So, for example, drinking would be an example of a status offense. 
uh, skipping school, or incorrigibility, all examples of status offenses. The maximum age at which somebody would be responded to through the JDA also varied by province, speaking more to that issue of judicial discretion. And we saw, for example, some people believing that the JDA was too strict and others believing that it's not strict enough. And these are sort of some common themes that carry forward to the YOA and the YCJA. So after the JDA came the YOA that ran from 1984 to 2003. And the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was especially instrumental in why the Young Offenders Act came about. Some of the issues were, for example, the use of status offenses. And the use of status offenses was believed to be a violation of a youth's charter rights and freedoms. It's like cruel and unusual punishment. We're gonna say that youth are not as responsible for their behavior as adults, but we're yet going to punish them more severely than adults for certain behaviors. Indeterminate sanctions were another sort of violation of charter rights to sort of try and address provincial disparities, the minimum age was raised to 12. And again, the YOA sort of explicitly acknowledged that, yeah, youth are criminally responsible. So we now are going to have sentences as opposed to the JDA that had dispositions. But we also acknowledge that they're not responsible to the same degree as adults. So the Young Offenders Act had kind of two purposes. One was to divert non-serious offenders and the other was to incarcerate serious offenders and the idea was that this would help rehabilitation for both groups. But part of the problem was a lack of specificity under the YOA in terms of when diversion should be used and when incarceration should be used. And so the YOA went through three main amendments. And you don't need to know the nitty gritty details of each amendment, but you should understand that the first amendment emphasized procedural amendments of so figuring out when and how youth would be transferred to adult court, when youth would be detained for pretrial detention as opposed to released on bail. The Get Tough on Crime amendments were basically just about cracking down on individuals involved in really serious offenses by erasing the maximum length of a sentence that a person could receive for offenses like first and second degree murder. So the YOA was replaced for a lot of different reasons. Again, it failed to address judicial disparities between provinces. Conservatives saw the act as being soft on crime. We, despite the conservatives seeing the act as soft on crime, under the YOA, Canada had the highest rate of incarceration of youth compared to any other Western industrialized nation, including the United States. And part of this was because of an overuse of pretrial detention. Despite the procedural amendments, there were still unclarities regarding the process of transferring youth to adult court. And we also saw paternalistic or at least protectionist sentencing practices where girls were more likely to receive more punitive sentences compared to boys. So now we get to the YCJ, which was still ongoing but was introduced in 2003 and it reserves its most serious interventions for the most serious crimes and reduces wants to reduce the over-reliance on incarceration for non-violent young persons. So it's trying to do exactly what the YOA wanted to do. The difference is that it's a little bit more effective. They dealt with the problem of being unclear about how and when to transfer youth to adult court by saying, we're no longer going to do that. So they got rid of transfers to adult court altogether. And instead, they implemented the possibility for adult sentences. So once a youth was convicted of a crime, then there could be the possibility that they would be sentenced as an adult. The YCJA tried to address the ongoing issue of the YOA in terms of the overrepresentation of Indigenous youth by creating Indigenous specific sentencing policies. And a lot of you in class focused on that as part of your presentation topic, and I think so we all now know that that wasn't very successful. But the YCJ was fairly successful in reducing the overall rate of incarceration. Of course, it wasn't hard to do because the rate was so high under the YOA. But one of the ways that the YCJ was able to reduce incarceration was by being more explicit to judges about when incarceration should be used. So under the YOA, judges didn't know when should I incarcerate? When should I release on a community supervision order like probation? So the YCJ basically told judges, look, there are only four conditions in which you can even begin to consider using custody as a sentence. 
So a youth can only be sentenced to custody if they have committed a violent offense or if they have a history of administrative offenses. Those are crimes where they're violating a court order. They can be incarcerated if they have committed an indictable offense and they have a history of prior findings of guilt, two or more crimes. And an indictable offense is an offense for which an adult could receive two or more years in custody. And if they don't have a prior criminal history, if they have committed an indictable offense and that indictable offense is associated with aggravating circumstances, then that person could also be sentenced to custody. But the key is could be. For each of these four gateways, the judge must consider whether any other possible sentencing option would be suitable for promoting rehabilitation as opposed to using a custody sentence. So a custody sentence is supposed to be used only as a last resort. Like the YOA, the YCJ also had alternative measures, but the YCJ was much more explicit in when these measures should be used. And they also clarified different types of alternative measures. One type is what's called an extrajudicial measure, and this is used primarily by police. It's meant to be a rehabilitative, restorative, or focus on victim offender reconciliation. And it's very, very like minor where police can like recommend that the youth attends a like youth group counseling session or engages in a restorative justice conference. But an extrajudicial measure can be as much as a warning or a caution or a referral. It can be nothing that's very punitive. Extrajudicial sanctions are reserved for the Crown Council. The Crown Council is looking at a particular case and it's a non-violent offense and it's a youth's first time having committed any offense. They might say that we do not think that it's useful to process this person through the formal justice system because not only is it more expensive and time consuming but also can result in labeling effects that might influence that individual to perpetrate crimes in the future. So there's still some criticisms of the YCJ. Some are have been dealt with or are not fair criticisms and others are fair criticisms. So an initial criticism was that the YCJ was too complex and the people thought that probation officers would have no idea when to recommend particular types of sentences, when they should recommend to Crown Council that a person be charged for breaching their probation order. But studies of probation officer decision making show that they have a really good understanding of the YCJ and they've been able to understand this complexity. One of the persistent issues in terms of like the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child is that the UN says we shouldn't be naming the names of young persons who have committed crimes, but the YCJ allows the justice system to do so if the youth has been sentenced as an adult. We still have not addressed regional disparities and probably never will when provinces are the ones responsible for paying for the implementation of the youth justice system. And certain groups view the YCJ as being soft on crime and being basically a failure. Don't know if it's necessarily accurate given the reductions that we've seen in the rate of crime. That's not to say there haven't been issues under the YCJ. One being the Archie Billard case. Archie Billard was a young male in Nova Scotia who had been released on bail for involvement in a driving related offense. He stole another car, he tried to evade police, and in doing so he struck down a young woman who was crossing at a crosswalk. And so there was a commission to review some of the decisions that were being made under the YCJ. So listen to a variety of experts and persons who have been victims of crimes, try to make some recommendations to improve the YCJ, included a lot of recommendations. You don't need to remember, memorize all 30, but they were mostly about, hey, we should maybe use pretrial detention more often in these types of cases of individuals who are repeatedly involved in crimes and we want to expand the definition of violence. So like reckless driving was not considered a violent offense because you had to have the intention to cause harm for the of an offense to be defined as violent. So they want to say that things that could result in violence unintentionally should still be considered a violent. So it's not just about youth justice legislation, it can also be about models of justice. And I talked about five different models, and you can see here they're organized on kind of like a political ideology spectrum, the welfare approach being more left-leaning, the crime control approach being more right-leaning, the modified justice approach, which is what Canada currently uses for the YCJ, is 
kind of at a balance where for the least serious forms of offending, the emphasis is diversion. For moderate offenses, the emphasis is community-based solutions. And for serious offenses, the emphasis is custody-based sentences. So students should have a look through each of these five models and be able to identify, for example, the time frame that they were used in Canada, their perspective on why crime occurs, their position on how to respond to such crime, and who the key players are in the justice system responsible for sort of carrying out the effectiveness of that model. So then on to youth policing. And we can think about the specific policing context in Vancouver, which relates to, for example, the Yankee 10 car, which involves a probation officer riding along with a police officer, and they're responsible for monitoring youth who are on bail or who are on probation, making sure that they're abiding by their conditions like curfew checks, but also helping to liaise with, for example, nonprofit centers in the downtown east side. There's another key nonprofit center called Covenant House in the Yale Town area, and they can help work with these centers to make sure that youth are safe. So this can be both a positive and a negative thing, depending on how you might look at it. A positive thing would be that police can be used to help keep youth safe, but others might say that we, this will result in the over-policing of the most marginalized youth, and maybe that's a bad thing. So I think we need actual research into this to see which one of these factors or perspectives is true. When it comes to the responsibilities of police, they have quite a few compared to when just arresting an adult, because when they arrest a youth, they also have to notify the parent. They have to notify where the youth is being detained, or they have to tell the parent where the youth is being detained, let the parent know the reason for the arrest. And when they are arresting the youth, they have to inform the youth of their charter rights, but not just you know, read it front to the letter of the law. They have to make sure that their rights are explained to the youth in a manner that they understand, especially because, as we'll talk about, youth tend to have a poor understanding of what a right means, might be more likely to waive their rights or think that their rights are something that they're not entitled to. Police have a lot of discretion. When it comes to minor offenses, they can basically do nothing, or they could just issue a minor warning and release the youth back onto the street, or it could take the youth home to their parents, ask the parent to be responsible for the punishment. They might take the youth to the station, kind of write them up, or just release them. When it comes to more serious offenses, still they could refer the youth to a program as opposed to taking a more formal measure. They might arrest and hold the youth in sheriff cells or have the youth move to custody. When it comes to charges, in most provinces in Canada, police will be the party responsible for charging a person with offense, an offense. In BC, we have a special Crown Council who's responsible for doing that, and so police simply recommend to Crown Council that charges be made in response to more serious offenses. When it comes to making these decisions or the factors that affect discretion, there are legal characteristics such as the degree of severity of the offense or the harm done, but also some extra legal characteristics, some which might make sense, like if it's a gang-related offense or a gang-affiliated youth that might impact their decision. The youth's home and school situation might also impact decision-making if the youth is in foster care or if the police believe that the youth's parents might not be suitable for responding to this issue. But also we can see some concerning types of individual characteristics affecting police decision-making, including mental health and race or ethnicity. I talked about extrajudicial measures, and what's really important to understand is currently under the YCGA, police have to consider the use of an extrajudicial measure. Not only that they have to consider it, but police should presume that the extrajudicial measure is the best way to respond to youth who have committed non-violent offenses and don't have a prior history of offending. That's not to say that a youth involved in a violent offense or a youth with a history of offending can't receive an extrajudicial measure. It's just that police have a like responsibility to say that, A, if they don't have a violent offense, I probably should presume that the extrajudicial measure is the best way to deal with this young person to keep them out of the formal court system. When police are interviewing youth, it's really important to make sure that the youth understands their rights because when it comes to persons in authority, youth 
have an issue with understanding that their statements might not feel voluntary. They might think that they have to give those statements to police. They don't understand that they have a right to remain silent. What I really want students who want to be police officers to understand is how you frame questions to youth is really important because of how suggestible youth are. Leading questions or closed answer questions, closed ended questions can lead to, for example, false confessions. We saw this in the Brendan Dassey case where he's really operating at a low functioning level and that made him more suggestible. So it was very easy for police to suggest something and he doesn't understand. So he's just looking at the police for guidance. And if the police say one thing, he is just going to kind of go along with it because they're the persons in authority. They must know what's right, so he'll just agree with them. And where this can become a particularly interesting or large issue is with respect to Mr. Big operations. So Mr. Big operations are where a police agency will pose as, for example, an organized crime group. And undercover officers will pose as like leaders of a gang or an organized crime group, recruit the suspect to be part of the gang. And then while that individual is in association with these undercover officers, the undercover officers will ask them about any outstanding crimes they've committed that might lead to uh, involvement in the justice system and say things like, hey, we have connections to police, connections to the courts, we can make these problems go away, just let us know what happened and we'll take care of it. In the United States, this procedure is actually considered illegal. And it's because there's a belief that it's especially susceptible to false confessions. And so we watched a documentary and it talks about lawyer Marie Haren, uh, who sort of pointed out that people are very vulnerable to false confessions and youth are especially vulnerable to false confessions because they have cognitive and emotional immaturities that are more prone to suggestibility and more compliant or submissive to authority. So we saw in this will, this video, there will be questions on it on the exam. Um, you don't necessarily need to rewatch it. If you watched it and you remember some things that happened in the video, you don't need to rewatch it. But it's important to sort of understand how the Sebastian Burns or T for Fay case played out. Next, we'll talk a little bit about courts and corrections and how we've responded to youth in conflict with the law. And one of the first decisions made in court is whether an individual will be released on bail or whether they will be held on pretrial detention. The YCJ initially wanted to reduce the use of pretrial detention because it was so overused under the YOA. But then when we got to the Nun Commission, there was sort of a return back to maybe pretrial detention is important for individuals with more lengthy histories of offending. And there are some particular issues with pretrial detention. One is we're going to see an even heightened overrepresentation of Indigenous youth. So we talked about how Indigenous youth are overrepresented in court statistics, but they're especially, they're even more so overrepresented in pretrial detention. And one reason for this might be related to a bias against youth in the care of MCFD. And an Indigenous young person is more likely to be in MCFD's care than a white youth. And the reason why there's this bias against kids in care is because the primary ground, which I'll talk about in a moment, says that if we can't confirm that the youth will definitely show up in court, then we will have to detain them on remand. And one of the sort of factors in deciding whether somebody is likely to show up in court is whether they have a fixed or stable address. So if a youth has been in and out of foster care homes or group homes or doesn't have actual biological parents watching over them, that might be a reason for why the kid will be detained under the primary ground. And in general, pretrial detention can contribute to net widening. I should say pretrial detention and remand are the same thing. They're synonyms. You can use them interchangeably. And so if a kid is on remand, that might contribute to net widening because we know that incarceration can create what are called state dependent effects. That's where by incarcerating someone, we cut off their social ties. They might have a positive tie to a family member or a teacher, a pastor, a coach, it doesn't matter. But by being in custody, they might lose that connection, that thing that Hershey would have talked about as attachment. 
And then when they're released from custody, they no longer have this attachment and that could increase their likelihood of reoffending. So the three grounds for remand or pretrial detention. The primary ground, as I mentioned, is to ensure attendance in court. The secondary ground is to prevent future crimes against or have contact with the victim. And the tertiary ground is if the other two grounds fail. So if we can't just if you're crown counsel and you can't justify detention on primary or secondary grounds, you would say that if we release this person into the community on bail, it's going to bring the criminal justice system into disrepute. Basically, the public is going to lose faith in the justice system. And if we do so, then the sort of the system is going to fall apart. So the person, if they've committed a really horrific offense, they should be detained regardless of the primary or secondary ground. So that's one of the roles of Crown Counsel is sort of determining whether an individual should be released on bail or remanded. So they play an important role in charge screening, looking at police officers' as will say statements to see if there is sufficient evidence to secure a conviction. And if it does seem like the person is guilty of an offense, deciding then, well, should we proceed with an extrajudicial sanction or formal court processing? So what I mean by that is if the Crown Council thinks that an extrajudicial sanction is appropriate, then they want to keep the youth out of the formal system and not actually go before a judge. If the youth is before a judge, the judge's role is basically to kind of look through information and make sense of the context of the young person. So they receive a lot of different sources of information. One is a pre-sentence report that's going to include information about the young person's past criminal history, their attitude towards the current offense, their family history, their educational history, their history of substance use. Typically also includes a psych assessment that's going to be typically completed by a forensic psychologist that might describe their mental health needs. If they're an Indigenous person, they should also be receiving a GLADU report. So these are all these different sources of information the judge needs to consider to make decisions about the appropriate, whether it's a custody sentence and its length, or whether they should be sentenced to a community-based sentence, or whether they should be sentenced as an adult rather as a youth. On that note, when the YCJ was first introduced, it had a specific role for presumptive offenses. So presumptive offenses are particularly serious offenses. And so the YCGA said that if a youth 14 or older is found guilty of certain serious or violent offenses, then they will receive an adult sentence. So the idea is right in the word presumptive. It's coming from the presumption order. You're going to presume that this person deserves an adult sentence. And so the onus is on defense counsel to show on the balance of probabilities that the individual should not be sentenced as an adult. So it's what we would recall, what we would call a reverse onus clause. The onus is on the defense counsel to show why a youth should not be sentenced as an adult. This lasted for about four years until the case of R versus DB in 2007. It said, no, this is against this individual's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Section 7. So we are going to get rid of these presumptive offenses. Well, more specifically, we're going to get rid of the reverse onus clause. You can still have individuals sentenced as an adult, but the onus is on the Crown Council to show on the balance of probabilities that this should be done. So I'm not going to ask you about specific cases and what happened. Instead, I'm going to ask you to tell me as much as you know about your favorite case that we've talked about under the YCJ or the case that you found most interesting or most relevant. When a judge is sentencing a youth to custody, there are actually three types of custody sentences that they can receive. There's a community-based custody sentence. So they receive custody, but they serve their custody sentence in the community. That's called a deferred custody and supervision order. Then they have their custody and community supervision order where they serve two thirds of their sentence in custody. They serve one third of their custody sentence in the community, and they typically follow that up with a period of probation. Another option is the Intensive Rehabilitative Custody and Community Supervision Order, or ERCS. 
and there are specific conditions in which an Erx order can be ordered. So the young person has to have been found guilty of one of those like presumptive offenses, murder, manslaughter, aggravated assault, aggravated sexual assault, or has a history of two serious violent offenses. And the young person must suffer from mental health symptoms, and there has to be grounds to believe that this treatment plan that's being proposed is actually going to work to prevent future presumptive offenses. And that program has to actually be appropriate for the young person. The young person has to be suitable for admission to that program. And so these can be highly intensive programs and they involve a lot of different criminal justice system actors. You're going to have probation officers, case managers, correctional officers, mental health nurses, forensic psychologists. So it's really quite interesting in terms of bringing a lot of different people together to develop a case plan for the young person. On the topic of programming, we have to think about the fact that youth have different programming needs compared to adults. And a lot of this relates to the fact that they just have less mature judgment. They're more likely to be influenced by their peers. They are less likely to think about long-term consequences. They have poor executive functions. They don't reason and plan as well as adults. So all of these things are things to work on for youth because we can see a really dramatic change in, for example, maturity of judgment as kids transition from adolescence to adulthood. So we might want programs that are going to really help ensure that these improvements do take place because these improvements happen for everybody. Every adolescent as they enter adulthood typically will become better at seeing the long-term consequences of their behavior, less influenced by their immediate desires. So these programs are there to help make sure that these transitions take place. Mark Lipsy's 2009 meta-analysis helped us make sense of which interventions are most useful. So we talked about six, and you'll see negative numbers here and positive numbers. Negative numbers indicate that that had a reduction in the probability of recidivism or the rate of recidivism, whereas the positive numbers indicate that that particular type of intervention increased the likelihood of recidivism. And so for each of these types of programs, you should kind of have an understanding of how they work. Surveillance is sort of like monitoring, having more intensive probation conditions. Deterrence is more punitive, thinking about even things like scared straight programs. Discipline is more about like boot camps, wilderness training programs, so you can see that those have not been particularly effective. Whereas restorative justice programs, counseling, and skill building programs have all been relatively effective in reducing the likelihood of recidivism. One strategy that kind of involves all of like skill building and counseling is Lena Ajumeri's Stop Now and Plan or SNAP program. Initially, it targeted boys who were between the ages of 6 to 11 who had some contact with police. Now there's also a program for SNAP specific to girls. And the aim, as I kind of mentioned, is based on things like skills training, cognitive problem solving. Often the parents are involved to develop some sort of like multi-systemic family therapy because if the parents have issues with their parenting style, that might make it difficult for the young person to develop more uh, appropriate responses to problems. So the stop now and plan acronym comes from this idea that's kind of cheesy, but it's like basically the first part is snap. You're gonna snap your fingers and that's gonna tell yourself to like stop and not react to the problem that's before you or the one that's causing you stress where you might behave inappropriately. So it emphasizes not responding to the problem right away. Instead, stop. Make sure you're calm, take some deep breaths, count to 10, get yourself in a place where you're mentally prepared to most appropriately think through the problem and how you're going to react to it. And even before you develop a reaction, you're going to kind of give yourself some self-confidence. Use coping statements, like you don't say them out loud, but ways to help the individual remain calm, like saying, yeah, this is hard, I don't like this, but I can do it, I'll figure out a way. And then the plan is, okay, now that I am calm, now that I'm confident, I can put forward a solution to solve this interpersonal problem. So the idea here is also to teach children to identify the triggers. Like what is it that makes them angry or upset so they can recognize kind of these high risk or danger situations. And then lastly, we talked about youth gang involvement. Importantly, we talked about different definitions of gangs. We'll go through this a little bit quickly, but criminal code, talk about how criminal organization, three more people, 
where they're getting together to commit serious offenses for profit. It's the main purpose of getting together. Police services to define gangs as groups who are engaging in intimidation or trying to monopolize or control certain areas uh, of unlawful activities so or certain types of crimes. And then different research definitions. So sometimes researchers just rely on official data. So did the police themselves, the police agency, define this individual as a gang member? Okay, fine. We'll define them as a gang member as well. Or we can talk to the person and ask them about, for example, whether they define themselves as a gang member or not. Historically, we've thought about gangs in terms of like being of specific ethnic groups or youth gangs versus adult gangs or gangs that commit crimes for very specific purposes, whether it's like street cred or for finance or to be more organized like a business. But what I would say is that these Historical perspectives have begun to break down, in part because through things like social network analysis, we see that there are not these clear gang boundaries. And in fact, when we look at research on how gangs survive and have greater longevity, gangs that are more diverse in terms of things like age and ethnicity typically survive longer because gangs need to constantly recruit. And if you decide that you're only going to recruit white individuals who are 40 years or older, you're kind of restricting the pool of individuals who you can recruit. So gangs have to be a little bit more flexible. One of the things I think I really try to emphasize in class is that there's a permeability to gang boundaries. What I mean by this is that gang members don't just co-offend with members of their same gang. So this was a case study that I did of members of what we'll just call the BC gang. That's not their actual name, but for confidentiality, I can't reveal their name. We had 18 individuals of this BC gang, and we looked at all of their co-offenders according to their court history. And when we look at their co-offenders, like 75% of them were individuals who were not members of the BC gang. So some were members of a different gang, others were just not gang members whatsoever. But the point here is that it's not like gangs are confined to the gang members. Gang members will co-offend with a variety of other different people, and this can be important for police, for example, to understand, so they're not just focusing on other gang members. In terms of longevity, gangs need to be able to recruit, and this is, can sometimes relate to having greater levels of diversity. Initiation can be important in longevity because initiations make people feel like they're more a part of something kind of special or important, and that can increase the length of time they'll spend in the gang. Once they're in the gang, it's important to have cohesion. So individuals have to get along. So we, here's where we can see where gangs need to balance cohesion and diversity. If you're recruiting too many new people, then maybe your cohesion isn't going to be as strong. So you have to find that balance. When we're looking at criminal behavior, it's really important for gangs to not just focus on like violent crimes that give them more street cred. They need to be earning money because some people won't want to be part of a gang that's not making money, but also usually these gangs need legal funds. And so if people are committing violent offenses, there's gonna be a lot of need for legal funds, but if people aren't committing things like drug trafficking, there'll be no money for those legal funds. On the topic of, again, gang boundaries, gangs need to have alliances. It's important to work with other people outside of the gang in order to create new criminal opportunities. So to learn a little bit more about youth involved in gangs, I talked about the incarcerated serious and violent young offender study and what we learned by interviewing kids who are gang involved and non-gang involved. So the first thing that we needed to do was establish whether gang members were more active in criminal behavior compared to other offenders who were not gang involved. So I didn't want to just compare like a gang member to your average high school kid, because of course gang members are going to be involved in a greater level of offending. We need to think about from the perspective of like courts and corrections, probation officers, will gang, does being a gang member matter for your risk of offending? And what we found was yes, it definitely does. Gang members had higher levels of offending, more serious offending, more time spent incarcerated, a lot of different things. Well, what we also found was that gang members were characterized by a much wider range of risk factors compared to non-gang members. Whether we looked at substance use or school behavior or involvement or family related dynamics, gang members were characterized by a greater amount of risk factors. So 
It's not just that gang members offend more frequently than non-gang members because of being in a gang. It's also because gang members carry all these other risk factors that are also influencing offending. So then we wanted to begin to understand gang members better. So we asked them a lot of questions about like whether they were recruited or how they joined the gang. Were they initiated? Did they leave? Were they allowed to leave? And so on. So some of the things that we found was that kids were generally motivated to join gangs by money. It wasn't so much like I was getting beat up at school and I needed some protection, so that's why I joined. Kids were attracted to gangs because of money. And it wasn't like they were being coerced to join gangs. They were joining because typically a friend or a family member was part of a gang. That doesn't mean that coercion didn't occur but mostly they had friends and family members who were part of the gang and that's how they got in. And most kids were initiated to the gang and there could be a real wide range of types of initiation. Sometimes kids were jumped in or beaten in. Other times they had to commit certain offenses for the gang or make a certain amount of money. And we began to find associations between the natures of motivations for joining gangs and the nature of initiations and how long or whether a kid left their gang. So for example, kids who were coerced to join the gang were more likely to stay in the gang. Kids who joined because a family member was getting involved were more likely to stay in the gang. Kids who experienced more severe initiations, like getting jumped into the gang, were more likely to stay in the gang. So by getting beat up, they were more likely to stay in the gang, perhaps because they were fearful that if they left the gang, they would also get beaten up. Gangs that had specific rules, or more specifically, gangs who used violence when members violated those rules, were gangs that were more likely to have their members not leave. Make sure you have a look at that aspect of the lecture to get a better understanding of sort of why and how kids join gangs, leave gangs, and so on. And then the last sort of theme I focused on for the gang lecture was social network analysis and talking about how yeah, it's not just Facebook or Twitter, it doesn't really involve that at all. It's about mapping connections between individuals or groups where those nodes or those little shapes, whether they're circles, triangles, squares, they represent an individual or a group like a specific gang. And then those lines or edges between them represent a connection between two nodes. So we can use those edges in different ways. An edge might represent that these two individuals have a conflict with one another or that these two individuals are co-offending together. What Martin Bouchard and I did in a study is look at how gangs decide who is going to commit homicide offenses by using social network analysis. So we looked at this idea of the suitable co-offender. So why do individuals select particular people to commit a co-offense together? And they can commit these offenses for different reasons. It could be related to, for example, they share similar traits, whether it is ethnicity, age, gender. One trait that they could share is gang membership. Another trait that they could share is like past history of committing offenses together. Another characteristic could be network centrality, which is a very social network indicator. It can indicate how much prestige an individual has. So if an individual is high in centrality, that might mean that they're an attractive person to commit a co-offense with because they're well known and that might give you more credibility as well. So we looked at how co-offenders are selected for a homicide offense. So you'll recall that in the BC gang, about 75% of the BC gang's co-offenders were non-gang members. However, when it came to homicide offenses, there were three different homicides committed and about 15 different individuals involved in those homicides, but all of those individuals were members of the BC gang. So the BC gang would commit crimes with a lot of different types of people, but when it came to homicide offenses specifically, it only committed homicide offenses with other members of the gang. So that could be helpful, for example, for police who are investigating gang-related homicides. Maybe it's going to help them narrow down suspects and say, okay, like maybe it's individuals specifically involved in this particular gang. So that's everything, not just for today, but for the entire class. I want to thank everybody for their participation. So